And this is uh, Devon Douglas, and she is driven by a desire to promote justice and equality at every level of society. Devon Douglas has become a leading voice for social progress in her community. Devon founded and currently oversees the Harris County Office of Community Engagement, where she has utilized her expertise to navigate communities throughout the, through complex government processes and obtain the aid they need following chemical and natural disasters. She has also organized and moderated the largest listening sessions in the history of Harris County, leading to an expansive community engagement strategy that has helped elevate and empower all its citizens. At every step of her career, Devon has consistently proven her ability to institute major societal improvements and continues to reformat systems to balance power. Before moving to Houston to fundamentally change the community relations process for Harris County, Devon used her vast experience in community organizing and policy development as Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Tulsa. While serving in this role, she authored the city's first resilience plan, an expansive strategy covering everything from economic development to community belonging based on racial justice. This desire for justice was born out of seeing police violence throughout childhood and college leading her into a career of public policy and change management. After graduating, started her career serving as an AmeriCorps VISTA in the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. Devon then moved on to a position with Oklahoma Policy Institute, where she worked as an economic opportunity and poverty policy analyst. She led campaigns to save broad-based tax credits and end predatory lending and also organized a social movement to increase responsive community policing and eliminate bias in policing. Devon holds a Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Tulsa and a Bachelor of Science from Missouri State University. Please welcome Devon Douglas. Okay, you can hear me? Yes? Yes. Add, okay, good. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Yvonne Douglas, as he said, and you may have noticed the grimace on my face as he was reading that because bios sound so obnoxious when someone else is reading them. It sounds awful. I sound like a just, just a bird, but that's okay. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking to you all today. Um, thank you, Erica, for reaching out to me. And also thank you, Senator Ikeley Freeman. It's lovely to see your face um, and to hear you talk about something that I'm super passionate about. And I will be doing some callbacks in this presentation um, to some of the things that you've said. So just as you heard in the bio, there is not um, social work, education, or practice in my background, uh, but a lot of the work that I do is social work, right? Um, I do policy work, um, and I, I do policy work instead of practicing law because I believe that these have great impacts on society um, and in great impacts on, on individuals. The work we do in government, um, and with community partnerships has the ability to uh, change people's lives for better or for worse. And my goal is to always make it better uh, for the have nots. It may not make it better for billionaires, but that's okay with me. So let me just walk you through what we're going to talk about. Because I've always been told you tell people what you're gonna say, you say it and you tell them what you say. So today we're going to talk about resilience, how to build resilience in a time of crisis. We're talking about beyond just bouncing back. We're gonna walk through the definition, then we're going to go through some of the characteristics of a resilient community. Then we're going to talk about community resilience and what you um, as social workers can be doing even in this time of crisis to build resilience. And then we're going to talk about personal resilience because that's just as important um, to your ability to build community resilience if you um, build it in yourself as well uh, concurrently um, because that's it's not possible for you to do your best if you're not your best. Um, yeah, so boom, what is resilience? So when I was the chief resilience officer for the city of Tulsa, I worked with the Rockefeller Foundation and their program 100 Resilient Cities. Um, and what we learned 
is that most people, when they think about resilience, they think about the ability to bounce back. Something bad happens to you, you bounce back from it. Um, something bad happens to your environment, like a flood or a hurricane or a tornado, and the community rebuilds, they bounce back, they're resilient. But there happens to be more to resilience than just that. Um, in fact, the way that 100 Resilient Cities, also known as 100 RC, um, and the way that I define resilience is the capacity of a person, a community, a church, um, a mosque, um, a school, a hospital, anyone, a city, to survive, adapt, grow, and thrive in the face of trauma. And when we talk about trauma in the resilience community, we bifurcate that. And that comes in the form of shocks and stresses. Now, typically, if we were in person, I would make everybody do this little dance that I do. Where it's like shocks and stresses, shocks and stresses. So you get it in your head. Um, but we're not in person, and I can't hear you or see you do the dance. So I'm just going to trust that in your free time, in order to um, do a little bit of exercise, you're going to do the shocks and stresses dance. I believe in you. I know you'll do it. Um, but what does that mean? What does it mean to survive, adapt, grow, and thrive in the face of shocks and stresses? Well, let's talk about shocks and stresses and then work our way from there. So a shock is typically a large-scale, one-time event, right? Um, that looks like economic collapse. Shocks also look like um, you know, if you were to use the human body as an analogy, a shock could be on the inside of you, like a heart attack, or a shock could be the losing of a loved one. These are, like I said, large scale um, and typically one time, meaning, yes, you can lose um, multiple uh, loved ones. Yes, you can experience multiple tornadoes, um, but it differs from stresses because stresses are the in the background kind of slow burning types of Trauma. These are things like inability to read or lack of public transportation or um, not enough money to survive on. So you're constantly having to use payday lenders. This looks like a city that has a police department that doesn't acknowledge that racism um, is real in their department. Can't think of any Oklahoma cities that would do that or any Texas cities for that matter, but in some places. It happens. Um, and so that's what those trauma, those different types of trauma look like. Something like uh, COVID-19 um, is also traumatic and it starts off really, it feels like a shock, um, but it's starting to um, unearth stresses. And oftentimes the shock types of trauma can unearth those slow burning traumas that were already there, um, that we have an economy built on uh, the backs of people who are not paid enough to begin with and then they get laid off or they're the folks who are most uh, likely to be subject to having to work through this, right? Um, I don't know what's happening in Oklahoma cities right now, but in Texas, we are, you know, fast food restaurants are alive and well, um, and those workers are having to deal with that, right? So that's, that's, an underlying stressor that we're seeing uh, because the shock has put that in, um, put it under, not even under a microscope, microscope, but um, it's, yeah, basically it's magnified it, right? So um, also when we think about resilience, like I said, people think about simply bouncing back. Oh, and that's the survive part of the definition. But beyond that, um, resilience is adapting right? You experience a form of trauma and then you learn that in order to be better for next time or to prevent the next time, you have to shift um, and change something either about the circumstance itself um, that you find yourself in or changing things um, about you or your surroundings so that you're better prepared. Um, for example, in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, we saw buyouts of places that were now known to be floodplains. We saw people who were still in floodplains building up their houses taller so that they can adapt and grow in the face of um, a trauma that they know is going to be ongoing in their region. Um, another form of adapting is just simply leaving um, the city of New Orleans, which we know we saw um, hundreds of thousands of people do. Um, 
And then there's the thriving, right? And I think that is most difficult to see during the trauma, during something like a pandemic. It's hard to see how you can be resilient and thrive in the midst of it, but it is possible. And one example that I would say um, thriving in this time of Corona uh, is how people are finding ways, they're adapting and growing and finding ways to um, create relationship without being able to necessarily touch each other. And that type of thriving really excites me. Um, because I'm an extrovert and this is really it's killing me softly, man, because I really like being around people. I don't like hugs, but I like being around people. And so learning how to thrive in the midst of not being able to have typical uh, contact has actually been kind of, um, it's been fun to learn how to do that and to get to know people a little bit better, like uh, at home conference uh, like this. So we walk through the definition, what are some of the community characteristics of resilience? Well, when we see a community that we would define as resilient, um, we're looking at physical and mental wellness, like uh, the Senator just talked about. Um, a tr truly resilient community is going to have access to health care and healthy foods and services. Um, the people and the uh, systems that are there are going to be um, self-sufficient and not just self-sufficient by themselves, but able to work um, in connection with each other to further strengthen um, their capacity and their ability to uh, serve. And then the, the last thing is that uh, the people in the organizations, the businesses in that community are going to be engaged with, with each other, like I was saying before, and they're going to be fully connected. Um, if you have one of these and not the other, you have some degree of resilience or you have degrees of these and that's great. We know, for example, in the city of Tulsa that um, there are organizations like um, Zero, excuse me, and like Schusterman Foundations that are working towards the physical and mental wellness uh, piece. Uh, but we also know that sometimes uh, people in our communities aren't self-sufficient. And so that knocks us down a little bit on our resilience. So we can see that on the collective level, how our community resilience could be strengthened. And things like COVID-19, as I said before, can highlight some of those places where we may have thought we were resilient, but we actually aren't as resilient as we thought. Um, but there's hope. Yes, there's hope. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and actually light just in the tunnel because we are the light, right? So we're about to walk through some ways that uh, we can strengthen our resilience both before and during crises like these. Um, so it's absolutely possible to build resilience during a crisis on the, com on the community level. Um, and so I'm just gonna walk through a couple of these like ways that we can do that. I feel like I'm talking so fast. This seemed like it was a really long presentation and now it doesn't seem very long, probably because um, I'm nervous. And so I'm talking at the speed of light. Okay, here we go. So one of the things that we can do at the community level to build resilience during crisis is to build upon what's already there, right? We know what our strengths are in our communities. And when I say community, I don't just mean a city. I mean, even the smaller communities um, that we all work with, right? So um, communities such as the Black community um, or the LGBTQ2S community, um, the uh, like mothers, working with mothers, that's a community, people who who are raising children, that's a whole community, and they know their strengths, and you know their strengths because you work with them. And so we have to build upon what's already there, even in a time of crisis. Um, for example, for many people, um, people who are uh, people of faith, who uh, practice a religion, we see the church as, or the faith community as, uh, something that's really strong for us and very important, right? And that could be true for many of the people and the organizations that you all work with. Well, how do we strengthen that when typically people meet together in large groups and that's been 
has been mixed, right? Um, so we're seeing how through technology, through other creative means, that we're building upon the relationships that are already there and thereby strengthening um, the resilience, not only of the faith community or those faith communities, but strengthening the individuals within it and strengthening the entire community at large. Um, another thing to build resilience specifically during this type of pandemic uh, for you all is to know and share government, community, and business resources. Color me surprised when AT&T, Xfinity, Verizon, all these different companies started saying, you know, we're not going to charge late fees, we're not going to collect um, for 60 days, right? These are things that, uh, depending on who uh, your clients are and the organizations are that you work with, this can be like really helpful information to folks. Um, and there, there are a multitude of these different things. So it's important that as people who are um, hope givers, that's how I see the social workers that have been in my life um, and the ones who are currently friends of mine. Um, hey, Angela, I don't know if you're still there, but hey, girl. Um, these, this is super important that you all are up to date because people are looking to you, right? And we want to use the most accurate and precise information. So um, similar to what Senator Ikey Freeman stated that, you know, you can put a Google search um, alerts on certain words. Um, maybe if you put it on coronavirus, you're going to get know a um, an avalanche of information but you know what your specific areas of work are and so focusing in on those you know plus uh COVID-19 or plus coronavirus uh, can be be the difference in eviction or not eviction in um where you are um in your city uh for some of your clients or it could be the difference between you know important things being cut off or people overdrafting and um you know we all different types of things there are resources out there and so um be on the lookout for those and um look into forums where those resources are the other thing is to get creative um one of the things that i I've seen uh, that was super creative about building resilience, and this is like on the community level, is a little girl had her birthday <clears throat> after this like physical distancing has started. And so people did a drive-by birthday party, right? Um, <laughs> putting balloons in their cars and putting on, you know, party hats and driving past while the little girl stood in her yard <laughs> while people, you know, yelled out happy birthday and honked and played fun songs and, you know, danced in their car while she um, was on her lawn. Uh, that's a level of creativity that I don't have. And so getting to see people trying new and different things so that they can, again, thrive during this and learning different ways that we may still keep up moving on um, into the future. Um, it's it's going to be super important to build our community resilience. Um, and then this is where I was thinking about the shout out to uh, Senator Ackley Freeman. Extra credit of things you can do to build resilience during this time is to shift systems. Shift systems. Collective action is so important to me. Um, what was not included in my bio is I'm uh, politically extremely progressive. And so what I'm seeing during this time is we're learning some of the things that we thought were impossible are actually possible. Um, we didn't think something like a universal basic income could be possible, and now we're seeing maybe that could be possible. So we're any of those things, uh, Medicaid, Medicare for all, all these different things that we thought may not have been possible for the people you serve, we're starting to see that at this time, maybe we can start shifting those conversations um, even faster than we would have been before, been able to before. Um, so I would say, uh, similar to what the Senator said, Collective action and like collective work and responsibility um, are so important right now and have the ability to change the way we live, work, pray, and play. Like it absolutely has the way of the uh, ability to shift that. And um, I just, part of the reason why I'm smiling is because I can see um, how something so awful and like heartbreaking can actually um, change our world for for the future um, and make things 
um, better, make us more sensitive, make us kinder, make our systems kinder, uh, make our systems more people friendly, which it should be anyway, because people are the ones that use them. So uh, now I talked a lot about the community level, but I'd like to talk about individual resilience. Um, and I will be able to share some of these links that I found with um, when I was doing research for this. So one of the things that I keep seeing people talk about is like how we need to be super happy, talk about all the great things that are going on in our lives. Um, but one of the things that I think is important for us as individuals, especially those of us who have direct contact with the public and we serve people, is that we need to allow ourselves to mourn, allow ourselves to have that moment of sadness. Um, this is a, a global uh, sadness that we're uh, feeling, and you should allow yourself time to feel that. Um, I'm not saying that you should wallow in it, but we do, we absolutely need to acknowledge the range of emotions that we're having, um, the frustration and anger um, that we may feel. Um, that's super important. Uh, I'm a Black woman, and I hear the angry Black woman stereotype quite a bit um, to describe me, to describe my mom, to describe other Black women that I know and love. And what I found is that, um, what has helped me break against that and um, just like, a, what is it called? Just not ignore it, but like eliminate that in my life is to feel out loud and in like be very real about the range of emotions that I have. Um, I think it's great that we are all super excited to try new things and, you know, um, do, you know, telehealth and also telehappy hours that everyone's doing. And that's great. Um, that's fun. It's great to see family and friends having family reunions on the computer if you have the ability and capacity to do that. But we also need to take time to recognize that this can, that this is frustrating for many of us. Um, it has shifted the way we do things, sometimes in a very uncomfortable way. Some of us have lost jobs um, and there's a time and a place for, um, for those tears. The second one is allow yourself to have joy. Even though things around us seem ridiculously awful, there's still space for joy. Um, there's still space for those ridiculous uh, memes that we're seeing on Facebook. Um, I've seen so many that are really, really good, really, really funny. Um, this before and after challenge that people are doing, um, the you got the whole world in your hands uh, challenge that I've seen singers doing, myself included. Um, it's There's joy there. There's a lot of fun there. Um, and I've seen, you know, things like, what is it called? Um, all of these different companies that do things virtually are now allowing uh, you know, free trials. Try some of those free trials. Like Daily Burn has this like exercise thing going on that I'm going to try for two weeks free. Um, so all these things, they're, they're good for us and it, it can be fun. We can bring joy um, when it feels like there isn't any or there shouldn't be any. Um, and then one specifically um, that I seen that I think is relevant to you all is fighting against the need complex. So um, like I said, I'm not a social worker by training, but one of the things I saw was that um, that this need complex is this, and you all probably already know what this means, but um, have almost like you get burnout because you, it feels like you are the only stopgap. Um, in many cases, it may actually be true that you are the one person that is stopping um, the people that you serve um, from utter dismay, um, utter like just falling apart. And if it weren't for you, the, you know, the, all the bad things happen. Um, but we have, but it's important that you as like true community servants um, fight against that, right? Fight against the, that, that burnout thing. So that goes back to self-care. I know it's almost a catchphrase at this point um, and it's kind of worn out, but it's still really important for you to take care of that, for you to take care of yourself and be healthy, um, not putting yourself in harm's way because if you're sick or you're hurt, um, then people can't get served, you can't do the thing that you wanna do, which is to bring hope and to, um, and to be, bring help to the people you serve. 
Another thing that I've seen that's super important during this time is to identify goals. A lot of times people are moving um, constantly. You're putting out little fires everywhere. <laughs> also a book and a TV show, you should watch it. Um, but you're constantly putting out these fires so you don't have time to think about what are some actual goals that I'd like to set both in my personal life and um, in my corporate life or in you know whatever type of life you have a political life what have you so it's important to take this time um this kind of in some ways it's a slow down in other ways it's a speed up but take some time to identify some goals that you have um and that helps strengthen your resilience right so you're able to better prepare for things um tornado season is around the corner i know hurricane season is around the corner so being creating like some preparation um for other types of trauma the shocks right um so that so that you're better prepared um and finally i put in my notes oil your scalp that is the that is the thing you need to oil your scalp now some of you um did not grow up with uh kinky curly hair so oiling your scalp uh, may seem like a really wild concept. I don't mean that you need to oil your scalp and that will make you be more resilient. What I mean is doing those things that are essential to your self-preservation and joy. Um, there, I have some, the strongest memories of sitting down on the floor uh, between my auntie's legs as she just parts my hair little by little and puts this oh gosh it's the best smell ever it's blue magic hair grease it kind of smells like like the sugariness left over from fruit loops at the bottom of a cereal bag it's so good um and just th that's what i need in my life right now and i'm in the process of doing my hair because that is self-preservation for me and that's good for my soul and you need those things too even if it feels um superfluous or it feels extravagant in a time of um of this level of trauma you will build your resilience through that um you, these are protective factors both for your hair and um for your soul for your life for your joy um so th that's one of my big uh, things oil your scalp stay hydrated um can't go to the nail shop get those high quality press on nails let me just show you these aren't even the high quality ones but get these if you need them uh, go on a jog or a yog with a soft J and just really um, take care of you. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, so finally, as I said before, we would walk through the definition, we talked through the definition of resilience at length. We talked through some characteristics, what communities look like when they are resilient and how that can be in different degrees. We talked about community resilience and what are some things that you in your profession um, can be doing to build that. And then we also talked about personal resilience and uh, some of the things that are needed in that space. So um, at this point, I think it's a good time to go to um, uh, questions and thank you. Oh, now I'm opening up the notes. This is so good. <laughs> These are so funny. You guys are funny. Yes, Yog with the Soft Day is so much, so much better than uh, jogging. I jog, I don't jog. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can send them to the like private chat if you don't want people to know it's you or you can send it to like the whole group. And I'll just pause because typing takes time. Oh yes, agree, headspace and calm are great. Um, yes, love it, feel, feel your feelings. Feelings are great, all of them. I can say this oil your scalp is gonna really stick with me. I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> you need to oil your scalp. It is so important. Oil well, it. I, you I, don't, not you. No, well, I don't, no, no, not with this, <laughs> but I dated a girl and I did the super eight with her and the beeswax. So I know yes. what you mean, I know what you mean. Ah, super eight, you're bringing back memories. Yes, yes, yes. Oh yes, hey Siobhan, how you doing girl? Yes, what do you do about your roots? You know what? Um, listen, one of the things that is super popular, I don't know, when did it start? Like 2006? That kind of ombre look, just call it an ombre look, Erica, and it just works. It's good. <laughs> it's good, I like it. 
Does anyone have any questions about resilience or government or resources? I think this is also a good opportunity for us to type out some of those resources that we've heard about um, or some of the things that companies and governments are doing. Um, oh, hey, everybody's here today. This is so good. I, this is like a, a reunion for me. I miss Oklahoma, if you guys can believe it. Texas is okay, but Oklahoma is better than okay. Get it? Because, okay. Okay, yeah, so if there's no, if there's no other question, if there's no questions, um, uh, I will let the next speaker go. I had a really great time doing this, and um, I also really learned a lot about, a lot more about social workers um, and the different types of social work work. Um, so thank you guys for all you do. I'm thinking about doing the University of Houston's program and it's like social work and government mixed together. So I'm thinking about doing that since I'm currently actually unemployed. So if anybody has any tips there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Had a great time. Talk to you soon.